Come on, you can do better than that. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Cool. Welcome to day three of your annual meeting. And kicking off today, we have a great contemporary military forum titled Increasing the Speed of Warfighter Innovation. As your professional association, the Association of the United States Army is proud to provide forums like this one throughout the year that broaden the knowledge base of our Army and our Army professionals and those who support our Army. AUSA amplifies the Army's narrative to audiences inside the Army and help to further the Association's mission to be the voice for the Army and support for the soldier. Of course, we cannot do this alone. AUSA relies on its members to help tell the Army's story and to support our soldiers and their families. A strong membership base is vitally important for our advocacy efforts in Congress, the Pentagon, and the Defense Industrial Base. And throughout the public, through our 122 chapters around the United States and the world. Who here is a member of AUSA? Good answer. <laughs> for those who raised their hand, thank you. For everyone else, unless you opted out when you registered, you're now a basic no-cost member. Thank you very much. If you're not already a premier member and would like to elevate your membership, please visit the AUSA member zone located at the L Street Bridge near Halls D and E, or sign up online at AUSA.org slash membership. We can't do this without you. But, um, uh, in the green room, we had some gifts that we gave out to the, uh, to the panelists. It looks like a bottle of wine, but it really isn't. It is a great AUSA umbrella. <laughs> On behalf of General Brown, AUSA's president, and the rest of our AUSA team, thanks to these speakers for that great work they're going to do. Now we'll turn it over to our, Alexander, to our moderator, Dr. Alexander Miller, Chief Technical Officer, Office of the Chief of Staff of the Army. Thank you. Okay, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, great. Hey, one, please fill in. Like, the, nobody's going to bite you, and there's no splash zone. So if you're standing in the back, fill in chairs. There's no, I know it's weird to, to do it after somebody talks. It's okay. Um, good morning. So I'm Alex Miller. I am the uh, Chief Technology Officer for the Chief of Staff of the Army. Um, I have the honor of actually leading this panel. Normally, I, I, I get a lot of questions, and I get to defer it to all of my friends and my partners and my boss. Um, so good morning and welcome to day three of AUSA. The, I know that there was a title on the AUSA registry, but let me tell you what we're going to talk about. Accelerating the velocity of warfighter capability delivery. Still good on, well, that's weird. There's two mics. Can you turn off my lapel mic? Um, the, the reason why, because normally at AUSA, the panels would be some commander saying, I have a problem and I need to change the way I do business to fight better. And there'd be a PM and they'd go, we need to change the way we do business to deliver on that capabilities needs. And then there'd be so some of our vendor partners going, hey, here's sort of the technology that we're working with and here's the processes internal to us. And the reason why this is different is because we're bringing the leadership and we're bringing the people who actually sign contracts. And what we're gonna tell you is, here's what we're doing differently, not what we need to do differently. And I wanna remind everyone, the secretary and the chief both said something pretty powerful Monday during the secretary's speech and yesterday during the Eisenhower lunch with the chief. The secretary asked, is what we're doing more lethal? Does it make sense for the future? The most que important question both of those leaders asked were, do the capabilities and the programs that we're working on right now still make sense? pretty powerful when you have somebody going, hey, is what we're doing, does it still make sense? Can we still rationalize it? So the way that I'm going to open this up, I'm going to allow each of the panelists to give two or three minutes of, of what's on their mind in terms of accelerating the velocity of warfighter capability development. I've got a couple of, of proposed questions and themes, but my intent is to allow them to talk with each other and allow that conversation to flourish and then open it up for questions from the audience. Please, Please, please ask the questions that you want to be asked. This will be a very candid conversation. The correct thing to do is not bum rush the stage afterwards. We've all been to those panels. So ask the questions that you want to be asked, even if it's, even if it's a hard question to ask. Uh, what I will leave you with is, I got some wise counsel last night. I do believe it. 
everyone is trying to row in the right direction. Everyone is trying to be innovative in their niche. What the secretary and the chief and the leadership across the army are trying to do is give a North Star so that all of those niche areas are aligned. I do believe that. So we're gonna, we're gonna make that real. So with that, I'm gonna open up to, uh, General George, 41st Chief of Staff of the Army. Okay. I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thanks, Alex. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. Great to be here. Um, you can thank me for all of our folks up here wearing ties and looking all, normally this would be, be a hoodie crowd. Um, but I couldn't wear a hoodie. I didn't have an OCP hoodie, so I, I appreciate them all um, dressing up. And I'm looking around and I see a whole bunch of our um, Army nerds in the audience um, looking at some of them. So if there's any questions that I can't answer, I am going to throw a lifeline um, out there to, to everybody. So I, t I talked a lot about this yesterday and what we need to do to, to change, and change is, is really hard. Uh, I think uh, everybody here, a lot of folks here, are seeing what's changing on the battlefield and you know how rapidly that, that is changing. And um, so um, our approach to this is that uh, I don't think you're gonna, there's no big thing that's gonna change. I think we're probably just on the start, on the cusp of where this is going. And I've heard that from a lot of people that, that talk about this. So whatever we're, we're doing to start changing and adapting our formation, we just need to make sure that it's something that will continue on, um, that we're not buying obsolescence. I talked about that yesterday. And as we move forward, uh, all of our formations, you know, we're not gonna field something for 10 years. I use the, uh, an old UAS that we canceled earlier this year as a good example, um, where it was very good when it was developed in the late 90s. Um, but it, it took several years to field it, and then we still had it in our formation, you know, several years after that. And we, we've just got to change that whole buying model on, on what's happening here. And we, there's a lot of things that we need to do internally to our organization to change. And so when I explain this, it's, I think the Army has a lot of things to do to change, and I hope that they will be very open about what it is that you think we need to do to um, change and adapt. Um, we've talked to OSD about, hey, there's some things that I think we need to do across the joint force. And then there's the same thing at, at Congress. And I think that we're talking about agile funding. So there's a piece of this, I think, at every level that people need to be, you know, focused on. Um, and we need to go to people who understand um, how to make change rapidly and develop everybody together. And we're seeing this, I'm sure we're gonna get an opportunity to talk about it um, and what people are doing right now to help us with our command and control systems to see what we're, the changes we're getting in uncrewed systems. So I'm excited to be up here. I'm glad that nobody showed our uh, college transcripts um, up here before <laughs> this. This is where all the power's at over here to my right. Um, but appreciate you guys being here with us. So thank you very much. Awesome, sir. Thanks, uh, Chris Bros, Chief Strategy Officer, Anderil Industries. Uh, thank you. And I don't know if you all. Ah, perfect. You can hear me. Um, yeah, I didn't put on a hoodie, but I did put on pants. So you all can be. Uh, you know, it's a, it's not a normal day here. Um, you know, in a couple of minutes, what does accelerating the velocity of delivery look like? I mean, I think it's a couple of things that will, will sound like uh, you know resounding statements of the obvious that nonetheless need to be said. Um, you know, for us at Anderil, it is, it is just a ruthless focus on outcomes. Um, I find that, you know, and particularly in my experience, most of my career was in government, uh, we just tend to over-rotate on the inputs of everything. You know, we try to micromanage the inputs that are going into a system. We try to control uh, the actual sort of bits and pieces of how we think about contracting or requirements. Um, and you end up in these very perverse situations, which I saw plenty on the government side, where, you know, some vendor or some uh, one from industry will say, look, I, I delivered all of the, you know, kind of pieces of my contract. It's like, yeah, but the, like, the problem didn't get solved. Like, the mission is still unfulfilled. And I think uh, how we get to a better velocity is really focusing on uh, creating the incentives to deliver outcomes, recognizing that those outcomes are going to need to change as a function of time. They're going to need to respond to threats that are evolving quickly and technology that's evolving faster. Um, and in our experience, the only way you kind of get that signal 
uh, is obviously working with uh, you know the, the the folks who do the organizing, training, and equipping. But you know it's really the uh, the, the sort of the tight coupling of developers with operators. Um, everything that we've done that's been successful has, 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 has been a close partnership uh, with soldiers, with the operational force who is actually living that problem every single day and is going to give you the unvarnished truth about what works and what doesn't, what's changing and what isn't. Um, and I think the, the sort of uh, the, the final thing I'll say on this, you know, which is intimately tied to the idea of outcomes is accountability. Um, again, I think, you know, from my experience in government, we end up in all of these situations, uh, both in government and in industry, where it's hard to sort of, uh, you know, sort of figure out the single throat to choke for why something isn't working. Uh, you know, on the government side, uh, we have a requirements process, a programming and budgeting process, an acquisitions process, and then, oh, by the way, we've got authorizers and appropriators, and that's all right and good in a democracy. The challenge becomes none of those folks work for one another, and it becomes someone whose first name is chief or secretary that's got to integrate all of that stuff together and then be accountable to Congress. Um, I think in industry, we see the same thing where, you know, uh, well, your software didn't work because the network broke. Well, the network broke because the computing infrastructure is outdated, and everybody goes like this. Uh, so I think solving these significant problems that we're all talking about here at this conference and beyond uh, really comes down to how are we going to generate uh, real accountability for outcomes. Awesome. Thank you, Chris. Um, Tara Murphy Dougherty, CEO of Gavini, who, if you came off the Metro yesterday, the Gavini ground game was strong because they were throwing <laughs> the, the national security card at everyone. Tara. Alex, and thank you, sir, and thanks to the association for both throwing this amazing event this year as well and inviting me to, to join you on stage today. I was going to say that if you have spent any time at AUSA this week, you probably think Vini is a coffee company. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, let me start by introducing us to those of you who don't know Gavini. We're a software business, and our entire mission is to transform the defense acquisition process. What does that mean? It means that our software is used across the Army and across DOD to manage defense activities and especially defense programs, major defense acquisition programs. It's a cradle-to-grave system from science and technology to the production of capabilities to the sustainment for decades and sometimes generations of these systems. And yet, for the trillions of dollars that we put into the system in order to create exquisite capabilities for the warfighter, and rightfully so, we haven't given many capabilities to the people who manage those activities. I often think about it as when these guys win the next major program of record for some unbelievable autonomy system, that program is going to get managed on the government side in a spreadsheet. And so enter our software. The idea and the reason that this connects to delivering capability faster for the warfighter is because it's not just about efficiency in managing the programs, it's about better program outcomes, and better program outcomes across cost schedule, especially performance. There are so many challenges that this ecosystem of people who were involved in that end-to-end -end system understand at the macro level, especially in the industrial base. Sir, you made a great point both, yet, both yesterday and again this morning. We create new ca capabilities, and yet we can spot obsolescence challenges in systems coming off the production line. And yet, somehow, once that production system makes its way through its life cycle and into sustainment, it's like everybody forgot that part was obsolescent, or by then is probably obsolete. These are things that can be known today with data, with AI, and with software. And it is how we get out of being reactive as an army, as a Department of Defense, and anticipate these things. That anticipation can make everyone go faster. Awesome. Thank you, Tara. Sham Sankar, CTO, Palantir uh, Technologies. Well, thank you both for having me. Um, it, it, one of my perspectives on this is, is really looking at this through a historical lens. As we, as we seek to deter 
World War III, when we look back in time and think about the industrial base that we had at the dawn of World War II and into the Cold War, I think it actually looks very different than the one that we have today, which is a, a consequence of essentially not having great power competition for the last three decades. You know, we forget that we had an American industrial base, not a defense industrial base, that Chrysler built cars and missiles, that every camera, cereal box, and car that Americans bought was in service of national security. And that, unfortunately, is what our adversaries are doing today. You know, only 30% of Chinese Prime's revenue comes from the PLA. The rest is, you know, your neighbor subsidizing their lethality by buying cheap stuff on Amazon, unfortunately. And the reason I think that's important is when uh, Pontiac took over the production of the 20 millimeter Orlikon anti-aircraft gun uh, in World War II, the organic industrial base produced each unit took three and a half hours. Pontiac's know-how of building cars allowed them to get unit production time down to 15 minutes. And so we need to think about the ways that we leverage the breadth of America's incredibly so strong uh, industrial base beyond defense to actually ensure that we're providing the most lethality we can to our uniformed service members, the unfair advantage that you all really deserve. And I, I think I would just second uh, Chris's points on you know, having to be there with the soldiers to do this. You, the process that we have today, you could say the department broadly is operating in a structure that is the best run American company from the 1950s. You know, the, the car companies we had in America in the 1950s had to throw away their playbook in the 70s in the face of Japanese car competition. You know, how do we import the sort of agility all the way from the fiscal OODA loop, which to, two years to program money, can you imagine giving a private company those sort of constraints to compete in the market? They would die, they'd be outcompeted. And this is a little bit of a self-imposed constraint here. So how do, we, how do we get from two years to two months? Maybe even faster than that. What, what does DevSecOps for budgeting even look like? But this process that we're living within is excellently designed to solve problems deductively. Any problem that can be solved deductively and top down will be solved. The gap is anything that is fundamentally uncertain, that requires induction. That's why you have to be there with the soldiers on the front lines. The innovation doesn't come from eating strawberries in Palo Alto. You have to be on the factory floors of Detroit and the fire cells of Djibouti to empirically see the gaps in what is capable, what, what is possible today and what could be possible tomorrow. And then get into our own, you know, close the code chain if you want to improve the kill chain. Why are we not shipping updates every single night? How do we accelerate the pace of delivery based on the, the kind of, we have the top-down accountability that Chris was talking about. What about the, the soldier level accountability? Like, I, I need to do this tonight for this human who's sitting right next to me. And, and finding ways to bring the acquisition and development of what we're doing much closer to the people who are living in the fight every single day. Thank you. Okay, last, last but certainly not least, Danielle Moyer, Senior Executive Director at Army Contracting Command. Also, best kicks on stage. <laughs> sorry, sorry, I forgot my hoodie. <laughs> um, thank you all for having me. So, so usually I'm where um, all their great ideas come and die. Um, yeah, so what they do overnight, it takes me usually two years to put on a contract, and I probably forgot half of what they said by the time we awarded it. So we're here to change that. So, you know, using what all my friends here said, here, here's what we're trying to do. One, I believe that my job in contracting is a business advisor, right? The, the terms of contracting professionals, I kind of throw that out the door because I believe that my, my job and the culture that I should create in the contracting is to create the best business decisions for the Army, right? The, the rules exist for a reason. But, but forget the rules for a second. Develop, develop the, the best contracting strategy of how to get those things on, on contract. And how do you do that quick, right? So one of the things that we're really looking to doing, and I think a lot of you have seen it already out of um, all the digital work that we're doing, is trying to figure out how to get contracts awarded in less than six months. So for all the, the, the um, venture teams out there, right? Those days where you were planning 18 to 24 months, which in my last panel people just said you did, those, day, those days are over. You need to work faster um, because we're gonna get you real problems out soon. So the other thing that we're gonna do to, to be more agile or fast is we're very overly prescriptive on requirements. So we start in AFC with a great idea and we do a lot of experimentation. My job is when I'm working with the, the, the futures of which a great idea becomes something in ASALT that we can field that one day that hardware might go to AMC to sustain. How do I make the best business decision from the very beginning to the very end? 
Right now, what we don't do very well is we don't put a lot of incentives and disincentives in contracts. And I'll give you some examples of those. You know, a lot of times contracts to win, you guys have maybe a, a race to the bottom. And we don't necessarily want that, right? We want affordable contracts, but sometimes we want the best thing. Um, and then how do we incentivize you with the best thing n once you prove it? Right, so we're looking at ways, and we put this out on our recently um, IPSA, our military pay contract, to say, hey, once you prove you did this better and faster, we will give you this additional incentive. Um, also, going back to some maybe some disincentives or some things about um, what Tara talked about, um, we're also very reactive in contracting, right? So when obsolescence is an issue, right, I'll get c calls to say, hey, this product went obsolete and it doesn't exist, you know, it doesn't exist anymore. How are we going to figure out how to reverse engineer this or organically make it or what are we going to do? And I'm like, well, why didn't we think about that up front in the contracts? Why when I'm not why in the AFC stage am I looking at what are we testing out? Why then when it goes to ASOL and I award that contract, why isn't there a factor in there that considers your entire supply chain, the risk of your supply chain? And I'm not saying that I want, I don't, we don't want your IP. We want, we, want, we want you all out there and that's what we, I don't want to own that. But let's say there's a risk, right? Should, you know, I think in commercial industry, you guys put some, of, some data in escrow sometimes. That's what you do. We don't do that. We need to do that. So that's an, a trigger event, right? So hey, look, we reviewed your supply chain. Um, there might be some risk there. We're going to put this in an escrow account and pending maybe a trigger event. You've got a business. You don't want to be in this business anymore. You know, your 15th supplier um, is now gone because it was two guys in a garage. We now get that data. I can then recompete it, right? I, that then grows the industrial base. Or we have organic capabilities within the Army. and. You know, we, maybe we do public-private partnerships with some of our amazing depots. But so those are some things that we're doing to get real capability out, out fast and also to get contracts awarded sooner. So I, I do th we, we have a goal that contracts should be awarded in six months. Um, and we do that. Um, we really gotten away from the hundreds of pages of written proposals, right? You remember the days you get 800 pages and document everything and you probably get kicked out of a competition because your font was wrong? probably going to change that. Um, we want you to come demo. Like, what, what are you really doing? Show me, right? Is the button green or blue? I don't like that. You know, there should be real constant feedback in some tech demonstrations versus did you write it really well that you probably used some AI to write the proposal anyway, and then we kicked you out because your margins were too small. So those are all things that we're going to do to get to make sure we're lethal and to get things awarded quicker. I love that. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna start with some framework questions and, and allow them to, to talk with each other. Um, Chief, I'm gonna start over with you. Um, I heard three things just now, so you always have to be there with soldiers. Um, we have the best process of the 1950s, and we are overly prescriptive with our requirements. Uh, so, Chief, can you can you talk about some of the things or examples that you've seen through transforming contact or otherwise that enable us to go faster with capability delivery? Sure, I can, uh, I can give a whole bunch of examples and uh, really proud of what Army Futures Command is doing to kind of help, you know, lead us through this. Um, and transforming in contact is exactly what Chris was talking about, and that's the whole idea is that we actually have, we just finished with our second brigade that's out in Hawaii. We'll have our third brigade that will be over in, in Europe. We're testing in different environments because that's also important. Things work differently in different environments. Um, but we have the users, the testers, the developers that are right there on the ground with our troops. I was out in Hawaii and, you know, I would hear back from an NCO and you'd go like, hey, this one stinks. We don't want this. Or it needs to change and this is, you know, what we're looking for. Um, there was a lot of examples when we were down at JRTC, which was exactly what um, Sean was talking about, where they actually changed things overnight. And we would go back into the, the the C2 node, and things were adjusted, and that was happening on our network, and it was happening across all of our warfighting functions. So I, I that's the environment we're going to have to operate in, I think, from here going forward, just as fast as everything um, is changing. And um, the other part of this is, and it gets to the requirements aspect, is that oftentimes. Um, I think we put out a two-page characterization of needs for our network. And then we had all the experts, people who really know, you know, that understand this, and we have our own 
um, group of nerds that are um, a part of this as well. But they would actually tell us, hey, here's what we can do and here's how we can do it and this might be a better way to approach this. Um, and I, I think we're, we're getting faster with that too. And I've, I've been really um, encouraged, really proud of how all these, everybody is coming together. And what I've noticed on the network is um, for everybody that's been involved with that, all they want is for our soldiers to be more lethal. They want our commanders to have more information, you know, the information they need to, to sense and decide. Um, and that's happening inside of our formation. So I think, you know, now our challenge is how do we scale that? Because I, I think that that's, you know, what we need to do. And that gets to contracting and all these other things. And we're... We're getting ready to scale this to several divisions and, and across all warfighting war functions. Um, that's where we're going to need a little bit more agility up here so that we can you know, do the things that we need to do to make sure that we're doing that. And we just talked about the tactical level. We're also going to talk a lot more this year about the operational level with our multi-domain task force because all of this has to be connected. On the character of need statement, I think this is such an important point, and I couldn't agree more. I think Army Futures Command is leading in such a powerful and positive way in this regard. So to the point about how restrictive requirements are and how rapidly outdated they are, what is fantastic about a characteristics of need is that it creates a focus from the warfighter, the buyer side, on the problem and it allows industry to suggest the solutions. So if you want innovation, and you know that the vast majority of the innovation in the United States today is happening in the commercial sector, then why not describe your problems and seek that input rather than describing the solution you want. So we all know that's not a new idea. We all know that's the right direction to move. To see it come to life in multiple instances with the characteristics of need statements has been really powerful. And then I would underscore your point too, sir, about the challenge then becomes, okay, industry has provided a number of different potential solutions. You're gonna choose one. You might experiment with it. You might prototype it. And then ultimately, you have to write a contract for it. Well, that transition, I think, there are still some growing pains, put it that way. Maybe I can go off of what um, Tara just talked about. One of the things that we want to start doing um, in Army contracting is when we have a problem, so like you think about that characteristic need statements, and when we have a problem, we want to take that problem and give it to industry and not over-prescribe contracts. So right now, what we do is we give you guys an RFP, we show you the clinch, structure, we show you all the clauses, we tell you the contract type, right, all those things. Wouldn't the world be so much better if I just told you the problem, you propose back a solution, and then we determine the contract type based on your solution instead of me predetermining everything? So we're going to start piloting that because that could go faster. And maybe our award decision is based on your solution, how, how affordable that solution may be, or is, does that solution have a bunch of obsolescence issues in it? You know, there's so many things based on the individual program. But I've never seen that done in 20 years, and now I want to try it. So I think that would be a pretty cool thing to do. And then compare the solutions to each other, which may compare the contract types, right? Because some solutions you know, mean a different type of contract type than another. And I think that's something that we'll wind up trying to do here. And so much of this actually fits the philosophy of how warfighters fight. You know, we, have, we, we say that no plan survives first contact. Plans are useless, planning is invaluable. Well, the requirements document is a plan. A budget is a plan. So the idea that these things would somehow survive unchanged, you know, do doesn't seem right. And it's not how you guys would go into a fight either. And so all these things that I hear are kind of starting to approximate this idea that the process is useful, but maintaining the agility to be responsive. That's what transformation and contact actually looks like. At a point. Um, I also think it's really helpful to point to actual concrete examples of, of what's working, right? So often, you know, we get paralyzed by, my gosh, these problems are hard. How are we going to do it? Um, and I'll give you an example of a place where I think a lot of the things that we're talking about here are actually coming together. And obviously, it's something that Andrew is intimately involved in, so judge it on its merits. Um, we've been working on counter UAS with Special Operations Command for several years. 
Um, and before I go further, people are going to say, oh, well, they're breaking acquisition law and policy. They've got secret access to money. And it's like not true. It's a bunch of Army acquisition officers who are following acquisition policy and law to do the very things that we're talking about here. You have a rapidly evolving problem. Um, my requirements are going to change. I'm going to field different types of capabilities to different units. Um, technology is going to evolve. I need an ability to rapidly integrate best of breed systems. And I want the best of industry. I don't want just the best of Andrel. I want the best of what sensor providers, weapons providers, and others can bring to the table so that we can compose families of systems that get after the problem. And when those are obsolete in three years or three months, we can re, uh, reiterate, uh, you know, re, uh, uh, modernize the system. Um, they also don't want to get stuck in a problem of, you know, uh, on the one hand, we don't want the sort of traditional uh, lead systems integrator, give me $110 billion in 10 years and let's all hope for the best. Um, nor do we think, you know, uh, look, the government left to its own devices can kind of pull together an incredibly complex set of weapon systems and field them to soldiers who need them in times uh, and places. Um, so what came out of that, you know, is a program that they refer to as the Systems Integration Partnership. Um, and that is, a, that is a program that we're working on and delivering on. Our core contribution to that is an open software system. Um, and then we are working with that customer to compose families of systems to field. Um, just you know, a couple of uh, weeks ago, uh, you know, in support of CENTCOM and the uh, work that they're doing in the Desert Guardian series of exercises, we were able to provide that software directly to uh, multiple different industry partners um, open interfaces and software development kits, and they integrated their own sensors and their own weapons. Um, and we were able to demonstrate that in a couple of months, you know, we were able to bring in new sensors as well as Army program of record sensors and defectors uh, to get after an urgent problem that General Carrilla has in CENTCOM. So there are ways that we can do this. I'm not trying to suggest that you know, this is the one ring to rule them all. I am suggesting that there is a lot of creative space to do exactly what we're talking about in between these kinds of uh, you know, two trenches that we end up between government and industry often kind of getting stuck in and shooting at one another. Chris, super helpful, and I'm, I'm glad you brought up SOF because I was gonna I was gonna make a mention to them, and it's not because they're all sitting over my right shoulder staring at me. Um, so, audience participation time before before I lead into the next question, who has been delivered a system that met all of the requirements and just didn't work the way you knew it needed to? I did. Like when I was in Afghanistan, I know that the chief did. I know the whole team did. Um, so Danielle, I think I'll start with you. What you talked a little bit about this. You gave a, a tease. What is the process barriers for us to allow all the things we're talking about in terms of iterating with our customer, iterating with our soldiers? Because what I think makes the soft capabilities faster is not breaking the rules because they're not. It's their customer is willing to accept a 70% solution now rather than a 100% solution never. So what, what can we do or what are we doing to work sort of through that model? Yeah, so I would say perfection is good enough. Um, just, you know, in general, one of the things we do is we, we in contracting, right, we expect our, our customers um, to complete a whole package, right? Put all your documents together, come up with, put your, you know, two, two or one spaces after each period and determine your contract type and put this whole thing together and then we will then execute the contract, which works really well for like installation base ops type stuff, right? Buy and pour to pause, janitorial service, things like that. That does not work in the world that you live in. That, so that the culture in, in acquisition in the Army has got to change, right? So in general, what we have to do is we have to, we have to pull the teams together. So there, when there first becomes a problem, you need the acquisition team, you need the experimentation teams, you need the sustainment teams, um, and then you need to pull an industry, right, and talk about, talk about the problem. Um, what, what has happened in a lot of my career is we create acquisition strategies and contract strategies before we've done any of that. We, we write all the paperwork and then we send out a draft RFP and, that, and, that's, and that's too late. So what, what, what I have in my organization is, you know, we have like, like a, a little policy that says, hey, when there's a problem, that team gets together. We, and there's, I can tell you right now, a hundred ways to buy this water, right? It's what's important to you. Right? Are you, does it need to be spring water? Can it be purified? Does it need a, fit, a fitness equipment? Do you care that it's delivered fast? Or do you care how cheap it is, right? Those are all the questions that I should be asking 
not necessarily just the acquisition requirements team. I should be asking the actual user, what is important to you? Well, then that helps me ask industry, can you deliver this? Then from that, can you deliver it? What makes you different than you versus you? And then what is that discriminator to choose one of you? What happens now is we don't really do that really well. So if you guys all provide the same solution, I will still ask you all the same questions instead of coming up with a true discriminator to pick the best vendor, which then takes two years because I asked for the 800 pages and all those things. So it, it's a culture shift, especially in contracting, right? Because we're usually raised that, hey, I need all these specific documents to complete my ARP package is what we call it, and then we will execute it. So we have a, a big culture shift that we're working right now um, across the Army contracting organization, and we're, we're working really closely with ACE Law and DASAP to, to change this mindset, to say, what's your problem? Let me help you. Let me let me help you towards a solution and being very collaborative with industry. So I think a lot of you have seen like we're very, um, lots of draft RFPs, you know, asking you questions. Um, one of the things that those of you for industry, what I always tell people is, you know, a lot of times when I meet with industry, right, it's either you tell me what we did wrong and you tell me how great you are. Also tell me what I did right so I don't change it when your competitor says that thing was wrong. And also tell me what I don't know about your competitor because that helps me figure out the discriminators too. So that's usually the feedback too that I get. Your cap you know, your comp I can't tell you not to compete on things, so you don't have to tell me your capabilities. You'll tell me that when you compete, but tell me how I can help make those discriminators so that we're able to quickly make decisions. Because right now the biggest thing that, that takes forever, especially on programs that are you know, millions of dollars, is the source selection time. So could I, just on the same thread, Sean, Tara, and Chris, um, when you're doing business to business, because I know you, you're working that, what are we missing? So I, I, I love that response because it's real. What are we missing? Well, I, I think it may, maybe the, the philosophical point, at the risk of saying something a little controversial, is I think mon monopsony is the root of what ails us here. You know, when we were building ICBMs, the Army, Air Force, and Navy were all competing. There was no joint program office. It was this American aesthetic of competition is going to make us better. When we were building submarine launch ballistic missiles, we had four concurrent competing programs. There was real fundamental risk to buy down, and the retrospective analysis is it was cheaper and faster. People often throw out this idea that, oh, if we, we have all these parallel efforts, it's going to be more expensive, but history would suggest that you go faster. You don't achieve 85% reduction in launch costs like SpaceX uh, without that sort of competition. And you know, NASA's own internal cost estimates of building the Falcon 9 was using cost accounting, it would have been $4 billion. But Elon did it for $400 million. For $10 billion, Elon has put 300 rockets in orbit. For $11 billion, the state of California has built 1,600 feet of elevated rail with no rail. <laughs> so th there, th I think this, this in this very, so monopsony is, is a structural part of, like that's kind of part of your reality. So then you, you have to kind of wake up every day and try to fight that back a little bit and think about how do I approximate market mechanisms. At some fundamental level, we either believe in the free market or we don't. I like to quip that everybody, including the Russians and the Chinese, have given up on communism except for Cuba and the DOD. You know, we have these five-year centralized <laughs> plans. And so we, we need a little bit more overlap because that's where innovation comes from. And that's what enables industry to self-organize around this and pushes us to do better. We often fixate on how much competition, you know, we need more competition in industry. By all means, let's have that. But what, what I think we're actually missing, the highest order bit, is that we need more competition inside of government. That's how you break the monopsony and encourage uh, com, you know, innovation in, in that spirit. And I think that's a big part of how we can go much faster together. Well, uh, Daniel knows that I have no problem pointing out what the Army's doing wrong, so I'm going to start with something <laughs> the Army's doing right, which is uh, the point about that Daniel made about uh, soliciting feedback from industry. So all parts of DOD do this. It, it is a standard and significant part of the FAR, your mar market research activity. Maybe you hold an industry day. Uh, you know, you put out an RFI. The problem is 99 
99.99% of the time, that industry day is virtual and may as well have been a recorded commercial. I'm not sure the RFIs get read. It doesn't really matter because the acquisition strategy and the contracting path has been baked. And there's just not a robust understanding of the FAR within our own acquisition and contracting communities to realize that that is not, you know, the beginning of a procurement is not the time to box industry out and say, I don't know if I can talk to you about this. It's to bring industry in and have the, the back and forth in the conversation. So Daniel runs things very differently at Army Contracting Command, as we've seen recently. And the shift with the multiple word uh, software contract IDIQ, where it came out one way, very early stage, a number of us said, interesting idea, we're worried about some parts, and literally we were on the phone that afternoon, and we have seen change after change after change as many of us in industry, not, not just those of us on stage, provided feedback about here's where we think you need to go if this is the path you want to take. So the, the market research is just the first part of it. You have to actually listen. You have to understand what, what you're hearing, which is as much an educational challenge as it is a cultural one. And then what keeps us motivated to participate in this system, which we all are, it's just a question of how frustrated we are in any given day, is when you see that feedback actually influence the direction you're going. You know, we participate in this system. All three of our companies are committed to national security and the defense mission because we give a shit. And so we're going to keep pushing back when things look broken, but we will also happily show up and play when you re reciprocate by demonstrating that you're following along and you're trying to get to the right place to keep the ecosystem of competition among industry players as big as possible. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what are we missing? Um, I tend to think that we say it, but at the at the same time, I'm not sure we're, we're sort of fully internalizing how possible it is to go quickly. Um, and I don't just mean quickly on things like software where everyone sort of accepts that we can go quickly. Um, it is possible to go much faster on things like weapons development. Um, and we have to, right? I mean, how many war games have we run where we've run out of critical munitions in the first seven days of the war? Uh, and if we didn't believe that, we've got three years of empirical evidence in Ukraine to suggest that we're off by an order of magnitude. Uh, the number of weapons that we're going to need. Um, so when we when we talk about you know, and that Sham hit it right, right? The, the the Department of Defense, National Defense, is a monopsony. There is no getting around that. I don't think that anyone wants a consumer market for weapons. Um, the question then becomes, how do you actually create market-like mechanisms for things that can respond to them? We're never going to have a market for ICBMs. They're, they're just too exquisite. They're too, uh, you know, the, the supply base is too small. Um, maybe we once were, but it's not going to happen now. Um, but we can absolutely create market-like uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of incentives for things like different types of autonomous systems, different types of integrated C2 systems, different types of weapons. Um, and I think the, the point for the government is, I'm not just going to buy this once, right? I'm going to buy it, I'm going to consume it, and I'm going to buy it again. And when I buy it again, just like many things in the commercial world, I'm going to be buying a better version. Um, and that rate of velocity in terms of government as buyer is what creates the market incentives for lots of companies to get in and contribute because there's a clear understanding that if I didn't win this contract or this award, all right, well, you know, it's not gone forever, right? It's not like they just got tenure at a university and they're going to have it for the rest of their life. Um, there will be an opportunity if I invest in myself, if I, you know, bring my A game in a year or two or three, you know, to, to recompete this program and contribute. Um, and I think that's the kind of thing that we, we need almost a parallel process to field the kinds of autonomous systems and weapons that we're going to need at the scales we're going to need to do many of the things that we're talking about for great power competition. It, that, that makes a lot of sense. I'm going to riff off of that a little bit um, for, and ask something to the chief. Um, sir, you are one of the few people who have commanded a brigade, a division, and a corps in combat. And we hear a lot on the capability development side, we're bugging units if we let them try new things. The, the, could, could you get some of your thoughts on why and how some of our units are 
not testing, but using new kit, Nixon squad weapon, all the new capabilities, they're not being fielded everything quite yet, but they're really trying it and giving feedback in real time as, as part of what we're doing here. Yeah, and I don't know if there's anybody, I don't know if there's anybody, sorry. I don't know if there's anybody out here that's in one of our units, but um, I, that's not what I've experienced. I mean, battlefield innovation, we did this in Iraq and Afghanistan. And we had people over there that would come over, we're trying to solve the IED problem, or you name whatever mm -hmm. problem we were trying to solve, everybody was together, you know. And what I've, you know, just from talking about this and all the contracting, you know, that I have not been as familiar with growing up, um, but it's having everybody together that understands this. And too often we, you know, we go back to this uh, peacetime environment and you, we can judge where we're at right now. It's, you know, very volatile world where everybody kind of throws it over the fence to the next person who throws it over the fence. And we just all have to be together in, in figuring these kinds of things out. And what I have seen out there is that our units appreciate this. I mean, we have quite the opposite problem where everybody wants to, they want this inside of their formations. They want to be, they want to help the Army. First of all, they know it's gonna make them more lethal. It's gonna make them more mobile. They're gonna be lower signature. All the things that we can do with this new technology um, and they want to be a part of it. They want to have agency in how we're doing it. And the, the most important lessons we're learning, we're learning from our tactical leaders who actually have to fight these formations. So I could add on to that, you know, in some sense, the only requirement is winning. And that's the expression. That's why they want to experiment with this stuff. They want to have the incremental advantage that can be delivered. Uh, I take a lot of, I, I think one of the human factors that's most important here is that innovation requires some degree of chaos. It cannot be managed through a process. It's not very predictable. Greg LeMond, the World Championship cyclist, has this quote that I often go to for my own kind of self-therapy. Um, it doesn't get easier, you just go faster. Excellence is not pain-free. You know, I don't want to sound like a masochist, but if you're doing it right, it's going to be painful. Just because it's painful doesn't mean you're doing it right. But it, a lot, so every lesson you can learn about going faster is probably a good lesson. Every lesson you're trying to learn about how to make it less painful is probably, you know, you're missing the counterfactual, you're violating Chesterton's fence, and you're going to be making mistakes. Had a lot of thoughts on that. Uh, <laughs> the, the, um, I, I appreciate it. What I'd like to do is, is open it up to the audience for questions. Um, so, so please, how are we going to do this? Is there, are there microphones roaming around? Okay. So Major patalino has got some, some microphones. Please stand up, say where you're from, and, and ask your question. So. We got one here, two, three. There's a signal joke in here. Gotcha. Yeah, good morning. Thank you all for your time. My name is Cameron Hamilton. I was a former special operator in the SEAL teams. Uh, so thank you all for your service and for your investment in putting the, the right equipment at the right time with our warfighters. I want to ask a question that might be controversial, that some people might not want to talk about. Religion and politics are always things that you never involve <laughs> in any professional setting. We've recently seen another continuing resolution. From an acquisition perspective, I've worked in government as a civilian, civil servant, as well as as a service member, as well as on the contracting side as a civilian, and that always puts administrative burdens on being able to project long-term avenues of industry, development, R&D, you name it. So from your perspective, particularly those in industry, I'm curious, how much has a lack of a long-term appropriation process and real foresight on behalf of our government impacted your ability to innovate, to take risk, and to offer reasonable solutions for the military to then implement in the field. And that might be really broad, but I'd be really fascinated to know your perspective on that. I'm happy to tee off on that one. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think this is probably like the 12th year in a row that we've started the fiscal year on a continuing resolution. And the complete perverse thing is I think the government has begun to figure out like pretty well how to structure itself with the inevitable continuing resolution uh, that will follow. Um, and, and unfortunately, it's not just that you start on a CR, it's that the CRs are getting longer, right? So my guess is you'll probably get off the CR sometime in March of next year. Um, I think the, the thing that is often uh, kind of missed is that the, the worst part about a CR is actually felt by smaller and newer and sort of faster moving companies. 
Um, you know, if, if Anduril had 125 big programs of record, I don't care about a CR. I mean, like literally the money I got last year is probably gonna look a lot like the money I'm gonna get next year, and we just kind of roll it over and keep doing the same thing. But if I'm trying to create new things, if I'm trying to move quickly, if I depend on next year's funding because I'm delivering something next year that literally didn't exist when that budget was put into concrete, um, a continuing revolution, a resolution is devastating. Um, because what is it doing? I mean, put aside the fact that you, know, you don't have flexibility of funding. Um, you can't move money, and you are locked in last year's requirements. So literally what you were saying is like, you cannot move into the future, you cannot change. You have to do this year what you did last year. Um, which is completely antithetical to what new and disruptive companies are trying to do, what many people in the government are trying to do to move this velocity of delivery faster. Much like working with DOD in general, I would say it just makes everything harder. And so to yes and Chris's point, just thinking about managing the business internally when you're driving, you know, when your revenue is driven by the government, 75 to 80 percent of your revenue coming in in three months at the end of the fiscal year is a terrible way to run anything. <laughs> and so it just requires companies that want to play in a meaningful way in this space to go through incredible machinations to do so. And I think one of the things that is interesting about what's happening now is you've had such an influx of venture capital into this market. And so you've got a lot of companies that are trying to get two sides of this world to understand each other. Uh, and explaining to you know your board who are investors that that's the way the money's going to come in and no, there's not really anything you can do to smooth it out uh, is a really fun conversation. <laughs> but you know, I, I, I would also agree that um, in addition to the, the fact that the government is figuring out how to work through CRs, unfortunately, you know, what happens is it creates a system where you just have to have people who know how to work within it. And so, yes, we'll, we've got a CR until December 20th. And then my guess is we'll get another one until February. And then we'll get a short one until March. And you just have to put in place all this extra stuff to navigate the system and understand it that you can maneuver around it when instead we'd much rather be building things. And I'd add to that the, you know, I think even stepping beyond the CR, the, the fiscal OODA loop, like our ability to close the cash chain is becoming the greatest issue that we actually have. I, I always cringe a little bit. I feel so bad for general officers. They, they will sometimes say something like, well, you know, we need all this congressional oversight because we've proven that we, you know, can't be trusted with this or that. I feel like that's a shibboleth. You know, you can't, you can't lop off one end of the distribution. I want to get rid of all the bad outcomes without lopping off the other end of the distribution, I'm gonna get rid of all the exceptional outcomes as a consequence. So overdoing process, like praying at the altar of process locks us into mediocrity. We need to give humans more discretion. Guess what, I screwed up so many things over 20 years at Palantir and I learned from every single one of them. You know, so we're depriving our, our soldiers of the ability to learn from these opportunities and you, you cannot expect perfection. And so I, I feel like, you know, the general officers don't give themselves enough credit and we take a little bit too much of a beating from Congress here. There's probably some structural, you know, we, we have to kind of price in CRs. I don't, I don't think you can magically make them go away, but I think the, the long-term effect is really that we're, we're, we're lopping off any hope we have of excellence. We're creating a system that is pro-incumbent and anti-new entrant, and we just lock ourselves down. Hey, Alex, I'm gonna, I wanna make a comment because I'm wondering if we can't, we always look for the, you know, this way or this way if there's somewhere in between and I think that's kind of what we're looking at with um, could we build in something where we have agility in the and especially um, so that we understand that things are going to continue to change and you know last year in the in the fall after October 7th um, it, when Hamas ta attacked into Israel we knew we need to make make changes in the counter UAS and we were challenged to do that because we needed new things and we needed new quantities and we couldn't do that. So, you know, the question is, and this is kind of where we're going after with agile funding, can we, you know, do a little bit where we say, hey, these are the areas that we know are going to change. They're going to change in three weeks or three months or six months. Let's change it enough. We may have a continuing resolution, but you still have agility in counter UAS 
you know, uncrewed systems, electronic warfare, all the things that we know are going to change. And I think that that's where we got to look for solutions because it's a small part of our budget. And I think that, you know, that's not what we're going to be arguing over in the big grand scheme of things. And I think people all want us to be able to, to maintain velocity in those areas. And that's kind of why we're really focused on those that are changing. There's probably others, but nothing like what's happening in those three areas. Awesome. Love it. Next question. Hello. Hi, uh, Matthew Theta Informatics. Mr. Bros, I gotta say I appreciate the Lord of the Ring reference, especially considering we have two companies on stage named uh, after the IP. Um, <laughs> I was gonna say uh, for Daniela and Tara, I really appreciated the discussion on characteristic of need versus the requirements process. Um, you know, Henry Ford, for all of his faults, purportedly said, if I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. You know, and really the need is getting from point A to point B, and that's a much more flexible and productive you know, endeavor. Um, I was going to say, so when we talk about the speed and the pace of innovation, really the pacing threat is the near-peer adversaries. You look at China, you know, and they are increasing their number of roll-on, roll-off ships. They are stockpiling food commodities, selling off their U.S. Treasury bonds. Um, they are repeatedly violating the air defense side event identification zone of Taiwan, um, and they have a demographics crisis. You know, they know that every single year that they're delaying, uh, they're becoming less capable and, you know, we're becoming more capable. So the question is, how do you get that speed of delivery, um, you know, not 2030, not 2035, not 2040, but like 2027 or 2028, and what does it take to get there? Thank you. Uh, well, I'm happy to, to start. Thanks for the question. And it, it sort of touches on, Alex, your question at, at the outset. So maybe I'll just pick one particular area. You mentioned that China is increasing its numbers of roll-on, roll-off ships. It's increasing its numbers of everything. And I very much agree with uh, remarks that the chief has made about the incredible need for urgency right now. The combination of external and internal pressures the United States is facing from a national security perspective should have all of us absolutely freaking out. And there's probably no category where I think that is more true than in manufacturing and production. So with respect to the cratering American industrial base, at the same time trying to compete with China, which is ramping up production on all fronts, this is an area where we certainly have to go faster. And I think what we really need to do in the defense context is start incorporating supply chains into the kill chain. We talk about it internally at Cavini as from, the fa from factory to fires because it's not just about getting capability into the acquisition system or, okay, great, you figured out what you need to fight this near-peer competitor to take on this techno-military competition. You have to deploy it. It has to be fielded. You need it in the hands of the warfighter, like we've been talking about. And by the way, if you're going to sustain it and do so in a contested environment and probably for a protracted war, then you better be able to have the industrial base to back it up, then this is something that we do very poorly today because we tend to separate these worlds. And we tend to think about the kill chain in one context and, and operational concepts and the war fighting applications that the soldier needs on the field. And then there's the loggies and what they need and the assumption that we'll figure out how to get it to you in theater. And we just have to combine those because we aren't going to have, I think already today, we don't have the luxury in the system that we've had in the past to operate with, uh, with the freedom and access to material and capability from a production perspective. Okay. Can I add a point on production? Um, what I see a lot is trying to fix problems of large-scale production at the very end of that process. And I think in the work that we've done at Andrew over the past several years, and we've dug deep into this as we've looked to scale our own uh, production capacity, um, all of those problems need to be solved on the other end of the spectrum in the design phase. And I think when I look at so many of the things that we talk about needing to produce at scale, um, 
We have basically, for a generation, defined requirements that have led industry to design and build unproducible systems. Um, we have made requirements that have literally made these systems so exquisite, so expensive, uh, so impossible to scale to production because they are limited at every chain or every piece in terms of specialized labor, specialized supply chains, exquisite materials and processes, uh, that they become unproducible at the rates that we're all saying and the scales that we're all saying we need. And I think to get to the answer of the question, um, and I think this is a lot of what the chief is trying to drive on, is we need requirements that are actually at the beginning going to say, I need low cost, large volume, uh, hyper -produ you know, producible systems, weapons, uh, you know, platforms, vehicles, autonomous systems, uh, things that are actually going to put mass back on our side where I can produce them and change them at high rates. Uh, and I, when I, I just see we, we need more of those new programs. And, and I think that trying to solve, you know, how do I 10x production of something that was never designed to be produced in those volumes that doesn't have the industrial base to support it is, is almost asking the wrong question. Can, can, I, can I riff off of that? And um, Chief, we talk about gold-plated requirements. Um, and I know we have some of the, the CDIDs, the people who write and pen requirements. Can you talk about some of the, just for a second, on, on how to avoid those gold-plated requirements? I know you've talked about don't need it to be nuclear hardened or, you know, work at 100 feet underwater. Yeah, well, I think some of the things we were doing also is we have to talk about how it, it all is going to fit inside of our ecosystem. So I mean, I, give, I'm, I was thinking while Chris was talking about this, of one example for a vehicle. We want to build a vehicle with every, you know, certain type of type of capability that's in it. Say, add, add active protection, and all of these things. And all of where we need to go is where a lot of these capabilities are going to have to be modular and somebody else might do the active protection system and it can be plugged in there. I mean, it's a shell. It's like the same thing we're talking about with uh, uncrewed systems. The uncrewed system is going to get better, but the sensor is maybe really good and it's like an M4 on a rail. You, you, put, the, you put the sensor back on that and you have you know, a, real, a better platform from doing that. So I just think we have to be more modular and then we're not getting to all these cases where we have to integrate all of these big, hard systems that are put together. What that's also going to save us is that we have um, one of the things that we can't do in, is have all these field service representatives. It's got, stuff has got to be easy, intuitive, um, and be able to you know, use it on the battlefield. And I mean, we're seeing that with the systems that some of the stuff we're getting toward transformation and contact brigades, it, it, it doesn't come with five extra people to help make it work. They can make it work almost immediately. I mean, I'm talking to soldiers that say, I've had this for one day, and you know they've gotten pretty good at it. So I think it's a mindset change, and uh, I think we're on our way to doing it, and we just got to keep pressing and go through the pain um, that was referenced earlier. Sir, I think you had your hand up over there in the corner. And then we'll come, ma'am, we'll come over come over to you. And I know we're at 11.30. We're going to go for no more than about nine more minutes. So thanks for, for sticking with us. Sure. Thanks. Uh, Sean Carberry, National Defense Magazine. And I think this is a question probably a few people in the room have. Um, I've covered this conversation on and off since about 2016. And it's been very similar. The acquisition process, overly prescriptive, requirements-based, designed for big platforms, not innovative, need to present industry <coughs> challenges, problems to solve, need culture change, a lot of things that have been said here. So why is this conversation sounding so similar to last year, the year before? What's going to be different now? What are the lessons learned from efforts to make some of these changes? And what can we realistically expect to see going forward? How different is this conversation going to be at next year's AUSA? Well, I, I, I want to jump okay. on this one first. <laughs> um, so I, I always tell our folks, um, and there's a lot of these changes that we've been trying to institute, same thing with uh, what we've been doing to transform our brigades. And again, we've only gotten three of them, is that um, it's a, all about what we do. It's not about what we say. I know we're up here talking about these things, but it's actually, you know, you're going to grade our report card on what we can actually get accomplished here 
in the next year. Um, I, and I think that that's really what it's all about, what it is that we can change. I think a lot of these things we have recognized that we need to, that we need to you know, change. And it's not just at, I said this up front, it's not just at one level, and I think that that's what the challenge is. Everybody points the finger and we're seeing that and saying, hey, you know, I'm, I can't change, you know, until this changes, and this can't change until somebody gives us authority to change. And I think, you know, that's the same thing at our level. I think that's, these are our sandbags to fill up here in D.C., is that we all have to get together and figure out what needs to change. So I can tell you that the Army is very serious about making the changes that are inside of that. And we have um, talked about some broader things that I think we can change. We're trying to focus it on areas that we know we have to. We have no choice but to change for uncrewed systems, EW and counter UAS, we have to do that. And so I guess I would tell you that we'll do this next year and then we'll sit you in the front row and you can ask the first question. Because mm -hmm. that's really gonna be, results is what matters. At, at the risk of pointing out the obvious, the, the survivors of the Last Supper are not the folks who are up here with the chief talking about this now. In 2016, Andrel wasn't even founded. Uh, we forget that at the dawn of World War II, it was Leroy Grumman and Jack Northrup, not Northrup Grumman. It was Glenn Martin, not Lockheed Martin. Now it's Palmer Lucky and Brian Schimpf and the Sang brothers and Tara. We have $100 billion of capital that has been invested since 2019, again, well after the 2016 moment, to, in, to build in the national interest. And the founders are back. You know, the, the crazy engineers, the innovative folks, the, the kind of sclerotic nature that we achieved this sort of financialization of defense in the post Last Supper era, like that's, that's going away. And the pace at which we're delivering, like absolutely judge us by the results. But I, I think as someone who's been doing this since 2005, there were no front doors in the Defense Department in 2005. There was no AFWERX, there was no DIU. If you wanted to get started in national security, you had one opportunity, InQtel. Now there are side doors, side windows, cracked openings, you know, like everyone has shown up. The American industrial base has shown up to play and we're moving at pace. Can I, just two brief points. Um, I'm glad that the chief answered their question because that's really a question for the government. Um, my perception on this, having spent a lot of time in government now being in industry, I would just offer uh, two ideas. When we talk about change, I think we often sort of like cast it as capital C change, everything has to change. And I think what the chief said is really important, which is we need to change first and most importantly in some critical areas. And I think you mentioned autonomous systems, electronic warfare, command and control, uh, weapons, that's right. Those are areas where you can change much faster than if we're saying, you know, we've got to change, you know, big legacy, exquisite, you know, systems. That's just going to be a lot harder. So figuring out what needs to change fast and moving fast, I think, is exactly what you're, you're, you're focusing on with transformation and contact. Second thing I'll say, um, my experience in government is, you know, change is really hard. People don't like it. All that's true. Um, change only happens when people actually believe there's something worse than change. Um, and I think that's the real question is like whether we actually believe that. Like we say that, we say we want to change, but I think you've asked the right question, which is why are we not going to be having the same conversation next year when we were having many of the same conversations in years past? And that question really comes down to do we believe that there's something worse than changing? Um, the consequences of not changing. Have we actually internalized what that means? And that's also to include changing the practice of continuing resolutions. PLA's getting their money on time, like pretty sure of it. Um, so I think the, the question here is like, do we really believe that this time? Because that's the thing that will actually uh, drive that change forward. And I can just add to that, we've done it. So, and you know, I believe in just breaking things, right? Sometimes I believe in order to figure out if you really needed something, you break it. And I'm a very data-driven uh, leader in the Army. So let me give you some statistics. And, we make a lot of decisions in contracting acquisition based off of risk of um, a protest, right? So you, everybody has the ability to protest. You all have your time to protest. I'm not saying don't protest when you don't, um, when you feel like you did something wrong, but let me tell you my metrics. Last year, I awarded 22,000 actions, 22,000. Of those 22,000, the amount that could be protested, that were protested, was two. 2.4%. 2.4% of things that could have been protested were protested. Of all of the things that were protested, zero 
we're sustained. Meaning, we usually do the right thing. Now that sometimes we have to take you know, a corrective action, and when we take corrective actions, when we have in, our, in, 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 in my organization, it did not change in who the awardee was. Did we mess something up? Yeah, but overall we made the right decision. So from my opinion, to my workforce, I had 35 people between a contracting officer and me to make a contract award decision. At 50 million and above, which is pennies in my organization, 35, 35 people, and they all got five days to review something, broke it. I said, nope, it goes from you to me because my data shows that we're doing the right thing, basically 100% of the time. So we made those decisions, and now we've making, we're making contracts awards and hundreds of millions of dollars in six months of time. So game on. Okay. I appreciate it. I, I'm going to have to wrap this up, otherwise the XO is going to karate chop me. Um, so I'm going to do this real quick. Don't pray at the altar of process. Keep flexibility for funding agility. Iterate with our soldiers. Don't be overly prescriptive with our requirements. Close the code chain and the supply chain into the kill chain. Create the best business decisions for our senior leaders. Change only happens when people fear there's something worse than change. We're not trying to own your IP, and we're not limited to one contract or contract type. So, team, thank you so much. Chief, thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you. you.